And today I'm going to have a talk with my friend Sergey about high functions of stochastic vertex models. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Slava. So, yeah, first of all, thank you, Slava, for organizing and managing all the seminar. It is really great and enjoying it and glad to be a part of it to some extent. So, in any way, today I'm going to talk about stochastic six vertex model, which was actually a a bit discussed already during the seminar in the very beginning by Amol. And in certain way, there is some non trivial intersection, but it will not be too big, I hope. Anyway, let me start by reminding you what is the setup we're interested in. Well, this time was. So we are considering uh, so called stochastic six vertex model, which is defined using the following six vertex weights. Uh, this vertex weights depend on two parameters, which for now I assume to be fixed, and these parameters are Q and Z. And these weights are stochastic. Namely, well, this means that if I fix an incoming configuration, that is the configurations of arrows coming from below and from the left, then the sum of all possible outgoing configurations of the vertex weights will be equal to one. In particular, these two vertex weights by these stochastic conditions are already fixed to be equal to one, while the sum of these two weights and these two weights, both these sums are also equal to one. This is what it means to be stochastic. And using these vertex weights, I, okay, so for certain choice of parameters, both all these weights can be chosen to be positive, and uh, using this positive vertex weights, I can define a random model by considering a integer lattice in a positive quadrant of my of some plane, and uh, considering the vertex model on this lattice defined by the following boundary conditions called step boundary conditions. So on the bottom of my model, all incoming arrows are empty, all positions are empty, while on the left, all everywhere where it is possible, I have an incoming arrow. So on the left, everything is full. And having defined these initial conditions, I start sampling my random configuration by first looking at the vertex here and uh, looking at it in coming configuration and according to the vertex space choosing which way it will go either it will go up so this pass in coming from the middle left either will go up or to the right with the probability defined by this six vertex space and then i continue sampling my random configuration going along the vertices for which I have already defined my incoming configuration. This will produce some random configuration of paths in positive quadrant. And the main object we are interested in are so-called large scale asymptotics of this model. So this is one example of a picture one can consider. This is the this model I just described for a certain choice of parameters in a very, very large grid. And we want to somehow study this picture, somehow describe them, and try to find some features and behaviors hidden. So this is the general question, the general setup we are considering. So to describe this behavior and somehow study it, it turns out to convenient to define so-called height functions. Namely, in each square between the lines of my vertex model, I, after I have fixed some configuration, I can define a certain number for each square of this lattice, which will be called height, and which is defined by the following local rules. If I'm going to for example, up, and there is no line 
crossing, there is no line between the squares, then my function does not change. But each time I'm crossing the line of my model, I will increase my height function by one if I'm going up. Or in the same manner, if I'm going to the left, I will increase height function by one each time I'm crossing the line. So yeah, this local rules define height function up to a global additive shift. We fix this in a way that on the bottom the height function is constant is identical zero. So having to find this height function when the open state certain asymptotic properties of six vertex model in terms of it. Namely, it turns out that the height function when we are considering a large scale limit of our model has a, short, a certain shape which can be explicitly described. And it was done for the Stochastic Six Vertex model in the work of Bording, Corman, and Gore in 2014. And the result is stated here. So when we chose some direction along which we're considering our height function, the the limit of the height function divided by the distance to the origin will be will be converging to some deterministic function, which is explicitly described by this equation. And moreover, one can actually describe the so the limit will be deterministic, but the fluctuations will be random, and one can describe the law of these populations and it will turn out to be so-called tracy William distribution which appears a lot into a probability and it is pretty interesting result by itself but I'm, i don't want to talk about the probabilistic interest in, uh, the interest in the stuff from the probability point of view I would like to focus on actually on how such results can be obtained and how integrability of the model plays a certain role in obtaining such limit results. And the first step for obtaining, for example, this result by Borodin, Corbin, and Gorin was an explicit expression for a certain observable or an averages of certain observables, which are called few moments and uh, given by the following expression, I'm just taking my parameter Q, my parameter of the model, and take it to the power equal to height function times some integer. And well, this is the information of the usual moments, namely these are moments of u to the power i function. And uh, well, the first step in, the, in obtaining the limit result was finding an explicit expression for this average of this observable, which is certain integral in k variables and with the function being integrating depending on parameters of the model Q and Z and the position of the height function where on the position where we are computing our height function. After obtaining such an integral expression, one can so yeah, first of all, these averages and these few moments uniquely determine the distribution of the height function. And that's why in these integrals one can so all the information about this random variable is somehow hidden. So one can hope to be able to extend information about random variables in such expressions. And this can be done by collecting all these few moments in certain something similar to a generating function, obtaining certain integral expression for the generating function, and taking limits. One can perform this computation after this extract the limit result, which is stated on the top of the slide. So yeah, in this talk, I don't want to talk about 
this the techniques involved in obtaining the limit results from such formulas for a few moments. Instead, I want to focus on how such formulas can be obtained using the solvability of the models. So in the beginning of the semester, they told Amol was already talking about such formulas and he already gave a brief discussion how one can obtain such formulas. So let me, on this slide, let me remind you how one can approach this. So first of all, we can use so-called higher spin vertex model to construct a very good family of functions called uh, spin for little functions, which are rational deformations of uh, for little symmetric functions. Then using the trick by which consists of drawing the partition function for so drawing spin for, one can draw spin for little functions partition function type of high spin vertex model and uh, using the trick of drawing these two partition functions one on top of the other and applying and boxes to exchange them one can prove a Cauchy type summation identity between these functions on the other hand one can use the Ampaster equation to perform so-called algebraic beta and that's like argument to get explicit expressions for this for little spin for little functions and then one can use these two results following from your Baxter to prove certain orthogonality relations on these functions namely there will be two orthogonality relations one will be so called spatial orthogonality, and another one will be something called spectral orthogonality. And then, using all these results and all this machinery developed for this being for little functions, one can get expressions for certain observables, which, after several manipulations, will lead to an integral formula like this one. So this Sorry, I have a comment. I have a comment on that. Uh, okay. there, is, there is an easier way to 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 just use whole little wood polynomials, and uh, there is a matching between stochastic six vertex and whole little wood measures, which is explainable using Young Baxter equation. And after and no no RSK deformation is needed. And then uh, you uh, you simply apply uh, Diagonal operators, you know, McDonald operators, which are diagonal and whole little polynomials, to extract the same same formulas. That that saves about sixty percent of the work, I would say. That that is listed here. Okay. Yeah. This is one possible approach. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Leo. Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. The approach given this slide is one of several possible approaches to get such integral expression for a few moments. Yes, but in any way, the approach I have just described is in a certain way, it's nice feature is that in a certain way it is constructive and as far as I recall, the method described by Lee is also in a certain way constructive because it uses the Machinery somehow developed using vertex models or some solvability kind from Young Baxter to, in, in, to arrive to an integral expression for few models in some number of some, some number of steps. So unfortunately, sometimes some of the steps might so there are a lot of steps involved in this proofs and well, as Leo mentioned, there are other proofs where there are fewer steps involved, but still some of these proofs might be might get more complicated if we try to consider more general settings. So in this talk today, I want to describe another approach which was developed by me and Yoshi Buketov. And uh, 
this approach allows to somehow cheat a bit and to prove the integral expressions for few moments by just verifying them without giving any insight on how to obtain these formulas. So let me describe the general idea. So we want to prove that two expressions coincide. And uh, to do so, one possible approach is to construct a certain recurrence relation on both sides of this identity and to check that both sides verify this, uh, satisfy this relation. Then one can show some initial condition. And after you do this by induction, your identity will follow. So it turns out that there is a certain recurrence relation on these few moments of height functions in a very certain for a very specific choice of the points where we are looking at our height functions. Then if you consider a certain collection of points which uh, which lie on an up left path of our plane, for example, something like this, here are the points where I encountered my height function. And all of them are either to the north west of each other or to the southeast of each other. So yeah, here I'm computing height function, one point and another point and so on. So it turns out if I'm interested in the Q moment related to the high functions in some collection of points arranged in this way, I can focus on one particular vertex of on some particular corner of this path along which my points are placed. And it turns out that I can describe the average of this observable here in terms of averages of, of, of very similar observables of the, the same few moments, which are computed at some points below the initial point X, the initial corner I'm focusing right now on. So basically it turns out that if I will fix some corner of this up left path, then I can express the Q, the Q moments for these points in terms of Q moments where some of the points go either down or either down or to the left or to the down left of the position this points initially were. And this gives me some reconciliation on these Q moments. More precisely, this reconciliation can be explicitly described and it is done here. So let me give you a precise statement. So if I consider just one vertex and I fix an incoming configuration, so I fix what is going from below and from the left, then after I condition on this incoming configuration, all the randomness is uh, concentrated in the choice of what's going on in this vertex. And for example, that there will be a pass coming from the below, there will be randomness where this pass will go. And then I can compute the average of uh, Q moment, I mean, of Q to the power, the height at the north east corner of this vertex, namely, I can compute the average of this random variable conditionally on the fact that I have fixed some kind of configuration. And this average will turn out to be always be a linear combination of height functions or, or some other height functions which will be in other corners of this vertex. Namely, if I'm 
considering like R evaluations of the height function in the north east corner, then it will be equal to R evaluations of the height function in below this corner with certain coefficient. Then it will be equal to evaluations of height functions where there is R minus one height function in the south east corner and just one height function diagonally across. And also the, there will be a charm corresponding to the case when the points where I will raise and go down, but one of them goes to the left. So basically one can express the average of this high function in terms of some smaller high functions, and this will give you a certain recurrence relation on the few moments. And using this relation, one can actually perform the machine, the idea I have announced initially. So one can just make a certain guess how the integral expression will look like. For, take the recurrence relation, which holds for the left-hand side of this equation, verify that the right-hand side satisfies this relation. And then after performing this relation for many times, at some point we will come to the situations when we will be computing high function on the bottom or left boundary of our quadrant. And then one can just prove this identity by computing integral on the right hand side, taking three and uh, taking residues. And this will be some computation I can do. So the idea I want to tell is that once we have some guess for how this integral expression will look like, and uh, we have some recurrence relation on the few moments, then we can try to avoid all these constructive R arguments, which are based on young bucks equations or some other relatively involved techniques by just performing this elementary inductive argument by checking the current relation for both sides of the equation and checking initial condition. And this will give usually simpler proof of this formulas, which uh, essential for, well, not essential, but usually serve as the first step of any analysis. analysis. So basically there are two ingredients in the proof I just mentioned. So the first one is somehow pr produce a reasonable function, reasonable identity you want to check and then find a recurrence relation for both sides of this identity. So how to find a suitable expression, you want, a suitable identity you want to check, this is something I'm not going to talk about in this today. Uh, this can be done in various ways. I can perform the computer simulations or perform some Cauchy type identity arguments like the one I sketched before or one mentioned by Leo. So there are several ways how to do so, but they're all quite complicated and I will not talk about them today. Instead, I will talk about the second part of this proof, namely these recurrence relations from few months of the height function. And I will try to convince you that these relations are actually somewhat beautiful and interesting to look into. So let me start by spending a little bit more time on this relation I just described several minutes ago. So if I will look precisely on this equation, then yeah. So this equation I have fixed initial condition, and then I have computed average of certain observable, which can be expressed as certain sum, 
over vertex traits on this height function. And basically, since I have four choices of my initial conditions, this so called local relation or this recurrence relation in few moments uh, actually is actually a collection of four different identities, one for each possible recurrent condition. So there are actually four identities here, hidden here. And uh, the general idea of what we want from our relation is something I try to explain, namely, if we start from evaluating height function several number of times in the northwest corner, the corner which is sort of going into the more random direction of our model, then we wanted to, ex to express this express it as sum over sum of the certain coefficients of smaller height functions which will be evaluated in other corners of this graphics. Since yeah if I will fix my incoming configuration the height functions in the other corners of the vertex will be actually fixed in terms of this incoming configuration, as long as I will fix some globalized shift of my height function. That's why I'm basically trying to express everything in terms of the height function in the other three corners. And basically, if I'm trying to find some relation like this, I can treat this coefficient as some variables. And then I will get a collection of four linear equations on the variables which are coefficients I'm going to use in my identity. And uh, basically finding a local relation is just a linear algebra problem. I have some number of linear equations, but four linear equations. I have some number of possible variables and I'm trying to find a solution for this system. So, okay, since the number of equations is one, so in the case when r is equal to one, for example, when there is only one instance of height function in computing, this will give me four linear equations and three variables, one variable for each possible corner when my evaluation of height function can go to. And, uh, well, okay, it is a little surprising that four equations with three variables have solution, but well, it's not such a big surprise. But in general, there will be much more variables than linear equations. So it's not so much surprising that some relation like this exists for six vertex model. And this is actually the way how such a relation was initially found as far as I understand by solving this system of linear equations. But well, more generally, we can treat six vertex plates, high six vertex plates as a uh, simplest object of a certain family of weights coming from a certain quantum group, namely UQS of Q hat. And from this point of view, the six vertex weights are somehow the simplest weights possible. They correspond to coefficients of R matrix between two standard representations, two dimensional. But instead of this, we can look at more general weights and ask ourselves if something, some identity like the one I mentioned before holds for more general weights. For example, if we will replace one of the representations by an arbitrary one model or another term from the other language will just perform fusion along one of the direction, we can get more general ways, which are, for example, listed here. These are so-called ISP, six vertex weights, which now depend on 
one additional parameter s, which corresponds to the parameter of the Verma module. And so when s is set to square root of q inverse, then this space will degenerate back to six vertex model. And well, this more general place actually also has a relation very similar to the previous one. Maybe one can basically add one additional parameter to the coefficients of the relation I showed a couple of slides before, and the resulting identity will still hold. And but this time this relation is a bit more rigid because compared to the six vertex module, now the number of possible incoming configurations is infinite. And that's why in this situation, this will be a solution to an infinite number of linear equations with finite number of variables, which is a bit more surprising. And one can obtain this identity for inclusion or this can be proved by just considering several cases of possible kind of configurations. And essentially, one can prove this identity by a direct computation. There is yet not so many techniques involved in proving such a relation. But more interesting thing happens when we consider even more general ways when we use along the both direction. Because in this case, uh, one can also write an explicit expression for the vertex states in terms of certain Q hypergeometric function or alternatives, a quite scary looking sum I have written here. So, and compared to the previous weights, this fully fused vertex weights are much more complicated because it's kind of hard to work with this expression for the weights. And when it's hard to work with the three expressions, life might become more complicated. But surprisingly, the local relation, so the relation for the height function around this fully used vertex still exists. And what is surprising is that it, in a certain way, is simpler than the vertex space themselves. Namely, if I will fix some kind of configuration coming from, so some number of arrows coming from below and from the left of my fully fused vertex, and I will consider the average of several copies of height function computed in the northeast corner, then this average will be expressed as a sum with pretty is as a sum with fully factorizable coefficients in terms of like few programming symbols of height functions in the other corners. So a times the function to be here, b times the function to be here, and c times the function computed here. And so this identity is a little bit more surprising because a priori, a priori it's, there is no reason to expect that there will be some nice coefficients involved in describing certain behavior of certain default moments of height functions around fully fused products. But it turns out that such identity still holds and that's in a certain way makes such local relations in my from my point of view this makes all this identities much more meaningful because this identity looks nice if it's me. And on the other hand the fully few space are the most general ways because they respond to the transit logic of two of the models and that's why one can expect so at this point, one can expect such a relation to hold for arbitrary stochastic vertex space for a solvable vertex model. That's why this 
population is somewhat important. And another feature of this particular case of the fully fused products compared to the two cases I talked before is that you know, so this relation really cannot be proved by some elementary methods by considering several cases of possible incoming configurations. And one needs to come up with a proof for this identity. And it turns out that actually this identity follows from two applications of the young box equation. Well, I, I will not talk a lot about the proof of this identity. But basically, the idea is to check this identity in a simpler case when a lot of things, both in the vertex plates and the relation itself, will cancel out. Namely, when I will set parameter one of the parameters of this equation equal to one, a lot of things will cancel out, and both vertex plates and the relation will be simpler. And in this case, this relation can be verified to be a particular case of the unbox equation. And then after having proved this equation for a simpler case, one can just look at the explicit expression for the fully fused weights and see that it in a certain way splits into two Parts which coincide with the simpler case proved by a master equation, and then verifying, uh, performing some algebra and exchanging for the order of summation, one can see that the more general relation for the fully fused case will be actually to will boil down to two applications of the simple equation or basically two applications of the unboxed equation. So in certain way, this local relation is, can, can be deduced from the several instances of the unboxed equation in a rather general way. So yeah, that's basically the general idea of how this, the general understanding of how this local relations actually appear. So they appear in a certain way from the deformation of the unboxed equation and from performing certain relations with it. That's why it's actually not so surprising that such relations fall in for general vertices, vertices of all the vertex members. And uh, so I have started this. So yeah, if there are any questions about this relations and about this few moments and relations I was talking about right now, it's a good place to ask about this because at this point I will actually stop talking about these relations and I will return to talking about vertex models and actually I will talk about the motivation how I can start to look at these relations and why they actually do, what was the original equation to look at with them. Okay, if there are no questions, that, okay. let me return to the vertex models and actually explain why I started to talk about these local relations. So what, why these local relations actually do were discovered and how, how they were motivated initially because well it was this is just certain information in Russia it looks like a certain tool which is not well okay it looks like a nice identity but it's still not quite clear why it is useful. So I think well, before the start to talk about all these relations, I have explained that how these relations can be used to prove certain integral expressions for certain observables of height, uh, described in terms of height. 
Well, in one part case, there were various other approaches, apart from this checking this recurrence relation, how to obtain these integral expressions. But uh, it turns out that when we want to go in a more interesting form, when we want to consider a colored vertex models, and we want to add colors in all of this, then all those methods described before start to get more complicated. Namely, uh, the method based on this Yambach's equations and the, the special functions, political functions, can be to some extent performed in the colored case, but unfortunately, the result will be the weaker version of the integral form of the few moments. It will be just some formula for a certain closely related observable. But in general, there was no method to somehow get very nice integral expressions in the colored way. And that was actually the initial motivation to look into this relation because they, in a certain way, understanding them is a way to prove, a very powerful way to prove integral expressions for more general vertex models. And it turns out that for the colored vertex models, this approach is actually the most fruitful one at the current moment. And until the end of my talk, I will just briefly tell you the colored analog of the of some of the results available for the one colored model. So the colored Stochastic six vertex model is defined by essentially the same collection of weights, but now instead of having just two possible states of an um, edge of my vertex model, I have some possible number of colors in which I'm coloring my paths. And depending on the order of these colors, my vertex, the, the weight of the vertex will be equal to a certain expression. So now I will also consider a bit more general model, namely for each row and for each column, I will assign a parameter along it. And my vertex weight depend on, will depend on two parameters, which will be assigned uniformly to the rows and to the columns. But basically, this color vertex space is just polarization of the six vertex space for one color model. Now, having defined this color space, I can, in the same way as before, define a random configuration on a positive quadrant by first by setting all the incoming colors from below equal to zero, which will correspond to something like absence of any paths along the edge. While on the left, I will have a so-called rainbow configuration of colors, and all the colors on the left will be different. And I will all, no, my colors are ordered and they will be labeled by integers. So on the left, all my colors will be different and they will be increasing. Then after, yeah, after I have fixed initial configuration, boundary conditions, I can just, as before, I can start sampling my model by first considering the bottomless, the bottom vertices and considering what's going on there, and then considering next vertices and so on, and assigning probabilities according to the vertex points. And then I will get a certain picture when I will consider some large scale model of this colored version. And uh, I am interested in, so it is interesting to some of try to describe some features of this picture. Unfortunately, this is much more complicated task than the one colored more than the one color picture. And I'm actually not aware if, if there are any 
some reasonable and symptomatic results, which are not just results about one college model. But yeah, the analysis of the college picture here is much less developed, and there are not so many results available. But the first step of the first conjecture, the first step of such analysis is finding something similar to the integral of expressions for the few moments which were really helpful in the one card case. And this step can be performed using the techniques of finding certain recurrence relation of the height function I can describe in the first part of my talk. Basically, so for the college model, there are still relations which hold on these few moments of the height functions. And they will have the, the form depicted here. So basically, now we'll be considering, we'll still fix some kind of configuration of the vertex, but now we'll consider height functions, so-called colored height functions. Namely, before we had we, our height functions were counting the, the number, they were counting the number of pairs below or to the right of the point when aware in computing my height function. So in the colored model, I can similarly define the high function by artificially splitting all my colors into the groups I'm caring about and the groups I do not care about. So basically, in the colored setting, I have actually infinite number of height functions, which will also depend not only on the position of uh, where I'm computing this height function, but also on the color. And in general, the height function of color C will be computing uh, the height with respect to the pairs of color greater or equal than C. And now, if I will fix one vertex and consider a bunch of these colored height functions in one corner of it, then the average of this q to the power equal to the sum of these height functions can be expressed in terms of the similar observables for high functions in like lower or to the left of this form, where some of these high functions will go to the bottom right corner of this picture. Or alternatively, some high functions can go in other corners. But what is important is that there is a certain recurrence relation which allows me to send some of the points of the relation of these five functions in lower or in lower corners or, or in the corners which are to the left of the initial square I was computing my height function in. And using the existence of such a relation, I can somehow produce some identity I want to prove, and then perform the same game, we repeat the same game, namely try to write explicitly the recurrence relation on the Q moment of the colored type functions I'm somehow interested in, some, somehow guess the right integral expression for this average, and then take my recurrence relation, which I, which is coming from the previous slide, and to try to verify that the integral on the right hand side satisfies the recurrence relation. This can be done for the colored model, and the result will give you the result will be an explicit integral expression for this averages of these observables. 
And in this integral expression, it, it looks relatively complicated, but it has several parts inside it. So there will be this part, which will depend only on the positions where I'm computing my high functions. There will be another part which will depend only on the colors of the height function I consider. And also these two parts will be somehow twisted with respect to each other by an action of the operator from the polynomial representation of the Horan effect algebra. And uh, this operator is, in certain sense, coming from the colored nature of this observable. So, yeah, the main idea is that this integral expression can be split in this part depending only on the color, the part which depends only on the positions where I'm computing my height function, and there will be some twist between them are coming from these operators from this integral representation. And uh, well, in particular, there are two extreme cases when this integral expression can be right written in a very simple form, For, especially the one card case when there are actually no colors and all the colors of the height functions and computing are equal to each other. Or alternatively, there is also the case where I'm focusing only on one position in my model and considering various height functions computed there. And the integral expression for both these cases will be very simple. They are explicitly given here. And one feature of these simple expressions is that they actually look very similar to each other. And uh, this is actually something one can use and uh, for a very specific choice of parameters of points where I'm computing high function of the model or the colors of these high functions which I'm computing. Uh, for a very specific choice of these parameters, these two integral expressions can be actually matched so they are equal to each other. So, for example, if I will consider a vertex model, a colored vertex model with this incoming boundary condition I described before, and I will be computing the height functions with respect to some colors in one place. So here I will be computing three height functions, which are greater or equal than the color C1. So this height function will be counting all these colors, plus height function, which is greater or equal than the other color, which will be counting all these colors, and the other height function, which will be counting some other colors. Then it turns out that looking at my integral expressions, I can see that the Q moment of this height functions will actually coincide with the other observer, the other Q moment for the other collection of height functions, where on the contrary, I will not distinguish any colors. So this will be observables of the one color stochastic vertex model. But this time they will be computed at different points. So yeah these three different points. And these three different points will be actually uniquely determined by the following condition that the number of rows between the point here where I was computing my color type function and the point here separating the two colors which um, this high function is distinguishing. So the number of rows here should coincide with the 
number of rows here for one of these three points when I'm computing this count with five functions. So basically, looking at the simple expressions, one can see that the question of computing some colored observable of this colored model can be actually reduced to computing multi-point observable of the high function of the colorless model. And no, okay, the, the way how I came to this fact to this talk is just by looking at some integral expressions. But if we will forget about integral expressions, this is a, a priori quite surprising fact. And it, it was initially very surprising when people discovered it. It is now called by so as so called shift invariance. And in general, it tells that there is huge number of symmetries of this colored model, which allow to replace computation of fine height functions with computation of another height functions. And uh, using such, so yeah, one way of finding all these symmetries is by looking at the integral expressions. There are also some other ways which lead to actually far more powerful results. But yes, the general idea is that the, in the scarlet model, there are a lot of symmetries and by the solvability of this model allows us to compute some nice integral, well, not nice, but some integral expressions which make, give us some hope that we can study these models and you, comparing the to the expressions with different or different situations can lead us to some nice identities between some situations when they are computed type functions. But unfortunately, this is the most general results known to me about the card model because well, the study of the card model started recently and there are not so many results yet about it. But this is some results which are normal now and basically i guess this is everything i can tell you about this model in this current model so i believe that this is the end of the okay. thank you Sergio.